All righty. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here in the house of the Lord this morning. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to everyone online. I got to do attendance yet. Welcome to you in the parking lot. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are going to be finishing up our this book this quarter. Next week starts our spring quarter, even though spring is not officially here yet, that, but that's how they break them up. Well, let's see here. Do a quick check to see who attendance for online. Let's see here. Morning, Cindy and Larry. Good to have you with us, as always. Thanks for joining us. Morning, Tammy Waite. Good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it looks like there's about four more people or groups of people on with us this morning. Uh, let me see here. Just taking a second. Morning, Janet and Paul. Good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Let's see here. Just uh, making sure. And anyone else, if you join us, please let us know you're on so we can take attendance. Let's see here. Just give me a second. And let's see here. Facebook Live. Let's see. Who's a uh, morning, Jim Burr. Good to have you with us. I'm not, not sure if you're not feeling well or a little sore, but glad you're joining us online this morning. Morning, Deanna. Good to have you with us. Hi, Jim Burr and Deanna are on with us online as well. Seems there's about four more, or three or four more on Facebook Live, so if you let us know who's on, we'd appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Ron Gibbler, good morning. Good to have you with us online, as always. Uh-oh, Facebook Live just ended. Uh, great. It did. Yes, it did. It just kicked us out, didn't it? Probably. Everything? Oh, and unplugged the fellowship hall, too. All right, anyhow. Yeah, it kicked you off, and then it connected, and then it kicked you off again. Is it boat? Everything. Yeah, everything. All right, so I'm going to let you restart it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started as David's restarting that. So, uh, uh, announcements. Let's go ahead and start with a few announcements. What did I just do with my... Oh, here it is. Okay. Go for a few announcements while David's getting this restarted. Regular scheduled services for the week. Um... Knit, uh, knits and knots on Thursday evening, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, Wednesday evening Bible study, we are doing going through uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and then choir practice following service on Wednesday evenings. Today we're having our annual election. So how that's going to work, the beginning of service this morning, if you're a church member, you will get a ballot. If you're a church member, you'll get a ballot. And... Uh, that at the very beginning of service, and then you'll turn those in, I believe, uh, right before uh, the service start, before pastor starts preaching, I think. But I know he'll, he'll direct that. But I know that we are going to hand out our ballots in service this morning and then pick them up. Uh, what, this Wednesday would be reports of leadership uh, from the for the church for the year, for the year 2023. Um, March 1st is a ladies' movie night. There's a, I believe there's a sign-up sheet out there for that in the hallway. March 3rd is our first uh, church potluck of the year, and that will follow morning worship service next Sunday. So please bring us bring a covered dish, potluck, and uh, join us after service next Sunday morning. March 16th is a birthday anniversary party for anybody who had birthdays or anniversaries January through March. April is our alabaster month, so if you need an alabaster box, if there's some out there yet, pick them up. If you don't see any, Please say something to myself or the pastor, and we may have to order some more. So uh, alabaster, of course, alabaster is our once a year. It's you know it's a box to put your change in. 
you can put dollar bills in there too as well, but any of that alabaster money goes specifically to building new churches around the world on the mission field. So that's what that's for. Someone's not happy at the moment. <laughs> Trenton's not happy. That's okay. All right. Uh, I believe that's all in the way of announcements. Praises or prayer requests this morning? Praises or prayer requests this morning? Praise for my mom. Yes. Uh, remember uh, Steph's mom? She's dealing with some health issues. So remember her? Yes, Bill? I go tomorrow to see my heart doctor. Okay. Remember Bill as he goes tomorrow to see his heart doctor? Any others? Want to remember this morning? They lowered my insulin. Oh, that's praise great. God. There's a praise. Good. Yeah. Thank the Lord for that, Dan. The only thing I don't really understand is why I'm losing weight and not trying to. Huh. Yeah. Don't worry about that. <laughs> He's not okay, well, yeah, Connie's telling us. There you go. Insulin makes you feel like you're not hungry. Mm. You can't tell when you are hungry. Yeah, well, that's... Uh, Praise the Lord. We're, that's weight. for sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll take you the praise. <laughs> we'll take <laughs> any other praise or prayer requests this morning. Remember Lois, uh, visitor this week. She was very upbeat. Uh, she's adjusting well to her new surroundings. Um, had a good visit with her. I handed I handed her some reading material. Uh, I, I was keeping standards for her and Sunday school lesson. She, I asked her if she wanted a Sunday school lesson devotional, and she said yes. She'd like to have those. She uh, definitely likes to read still. So, uh, but pray for her. Keep her in your prayers. Yes. Here, Carol. Yep. Remember Carol. And mom's friend Karen. Karen mentor. Okay. She used yeah. to work at Woodland. She is in the hospital. She's at Woodland for rehab. Okay. Remember Karen? Yes. Remember your dad. Yeah, remember dad. Um, any others? Want to remember this morning? All right, let's go to prayer then before we start the lesson. <laughs> Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many wonderful blessings. We thank you for your love and your goodness to each and every one of us. Thank you for all that you are, all that you do for us. Lord, you are good to us each and every day. Father, we bring before you the requests of the hour, uh, the needs, Lord. You know each and every heart, life, individual, and, and their situation. And we ask that you would just touch them, help them, bless them, heal them, and just uh, be very close to them. Lord, we ask that you would just uh, bless here in the Sunday School Hour, bless the lesson as we discuss it, use it for your glory, uh, use it to challenge us and to encourage us and teach us. Father, we ask that you would just bless in the morning worship service, bless in the election and, and Lord bless in the communion service as well. Just uh, speak through the pastor and, and may we hear the message we need to hear and just uh, just draw us all closer to you. Thank you for all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, as we get started here, um, let's see here. Uh, yes, so David, make sure you respond to any of those online trying to get connected. Yes, we're having some problems, but David's trying to get us reconnected. Yes, okay. Should be back up soon. Okay. All right, so um, before we start, I did want to mention something about discernment, right? We talk about discernment, and over the years, we talk about, you know, if we're going through a lesson or whatever, if, if we have questions about what the lesson writer wrote, just to, it's okay to question it, right? Uh, there's stretches of time where we have good lessons and good devotions, and there's sometimes we have ones that we kind of go scratch our head about. I, was, I would just say I was a little disappointed with the devotion this week. Uh, there was a, I just, it's very subtle and very, you know, it, it's always in little, just little bits where people will sprinkle in some things that you go, is that really right? When your lesson writer or not your lesson writer, our devotion writer this week, when he started with the first scripture this week, the scripture is about what? What's the first scripture about we're looking at this morning? It's persistence, right? Not giving up in prayer. But he chose to take that scripture and focus on social justice. So, it, it, again, it was very slight. It was very subtle. But it, 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 he changed the perspective of the whole scripture. Because when we read it today, that it says what the main purpose is. It says, so that you will not give up in praying. But the, 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 the devotional writer this week 
changed it subtly and used some buzzwords that concern me. Used uh, equity. When you hear someone talk about equity today, that's always a buzzword for social justice. Talked about, um, you know, who those who are vulnerable, and he talked about immigrants. Well, he didn't say it, but immigrants today in America aren't vulnerable. It's illegal immigrants who are vulnerable. Again, so he was very subtly sliding some things in there. So just when you read things, always use spiritual discernment. Get the Bible. Get the Bible out and look at what the Bible really says, not what a lesson writer might say or devotion writer. Again, we have, and every week we have a different devotion writer. And again, some are better than others, and some I would trust more than others. Do not tune your ears into man, but tune them into God. That's exactly right. That's why we keep our nose in God's word and be very sure of reading it. And when you read anything, whether it's our lessons or our devotions, make sure they line up with God's word, what it is saying. That's, that was the only the point I'm going to make about the devotions this week. And, and again, I went back and looked and saw who wrote it. He is a district superintendent from California. So that <laughs> did, it did not surprise me. Oh. So anyhow, that's all I'm going to say about that. So, uh, we're finishing up our unit on the parables of Jesus and Luke. And there's a, so much, Jesus used parables to speak truth to people, to show them an analogy and truth, to show them what the message he wanted to present. He used parables to make sure they understood it, that they got it. And we've been studying that through the weeks and today's no different. Uh, it, it's very, uh, again, Jesus' parables, and this one is different in, in one way. Jesus actually gives the reason for the parable up front before he even tells the parable. He doesn't want you to miss it. That's why it's so important. And that's why, again, I thought the lesson or the devotion writer this week was like off because Jesus gives the purpose, not what the, the devotion writer said. So, anyhow, this week is we're going to be in Luke 18, 1 through 14. And it's a life of persistence and humility. So he tells two parables here back to back, Jesus does. And the first one is about persistence, not giving up praying. That's an important lesson because you know how often in life we pray for something and, it, and we don't sit, think we're not seeing an answer and we're not seeing an answer. And you know what? God's or Jesus' lesson here is don't give up, keep praying. And we're going to talk, get into that. And then the second parable he tells, is a, teaches us the lesson of we should live lives of humility. We should be humble people. We should never boast about anything. We should never be arrogant about anything. And we'll get into that as, as through the lesson. So, uh, this week we're going to discover our faith is often demonstrated through our persistence in prayer, not giving up, and humility. Uh, session outcome, to seek to develop spiritual persistence and humility in our prayer life and relationship with God. Lesson title this morning is A Life of Persistence and Humility. So, um, as we get started, this is, this, I thought this was interesting the lesson writer said this because he's talking about the 1950s, and said, and, and, but some of this stuff is, we in our church have done as of recent, but this, listen to this. So, the 1950s evangelical church placed a strong emphasis on corporate prayer. Wednesday night gatherings were called what? Prayer meetings. We still used to call them prayer meetings after recently, right? There were all-night prayer vigils occasionally, sometimes with one or two people signing up for each hour and other times the whole congregation praying together for the entire night. There were watch night services on New Year's Eve to pray in the new year. We've done that. Cottage prayer meetings were held at homes. We've done that, right? Multiple nights of corporate prayer up leading up to revival services. Yes, we've done that. In church services, individuals were spontaneously asked to lead in prayer. Yes, we've done that, right? So, here's the question. Do you think any of these emphasis would work in our current culture? We have still, we have done them recently, right? In, in recent years, anyhow. Prayer is always a good thing. I don't care what the culture has said or where it's going or what it's done. Prayer is important. Prayer should always be an emphasis, okay? The church is, if it's not on its knees in prayer, is the church going to remain effective? No, it's not. Because prayer is our is our lifeline to God. Prayer, you know, there's the, what that old hymn, 
that Clarence Kramer used to sing about uh, uh, God's telephone, right? You remember that? I re oh, man, I love that old hymn, and it talked about, you know, it being the prayer. It's never busy. It's never off the hook. You know, you can always get through in prayer to God, right? Um, do you think people today value prayer as we once did? No. In general, no. I believe today, sadly, many people don't value prayer. They don't spend much time in it. People don't spend much time reading their Bibles either, sadly, right? That's the culture we live in. We have, we're too busy, too many things going on, and we wear ourselves out. And by the end of the day, when people, you know, whether you do devotions, I do mine in the morning because I'm, I'm, I'm getting up. I make sure I have time, you know, to do that as well as I'm awake. But if you wait to the end of the day sometimes, I hope maybe that's your... That's your ritual of when you or your your schedule of when you do your devotions. That's good. But today's culture, people are so busy, they get to the end of the day, just too tired. Uh, I'll get to that tomorrow. A lot of times people only pray when something goes awry. There you go. Yeah. I believe that is a huge thing that you most people today yeah. and that's in this culture only pray when it's their last resort. Yeah. Uh, they, things they don't know what else to do. I, I, so now I'm gonna pray. Well, we know as Christians we should live lives of prayer. That's in the lesson. And our first resort should always be God, going to him in prayer. Um, do we need to be taught to pray? Yeah. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. We There's no specific formula for prayer. So in that, no. But guess what? Jesus even what? Taught his disciples how to pray. He said, this, when you pray, this is how you should pray. Now, we repeat the Lord's Prayer, right? But the Lord's Prayer was more of an outline than it was a specific prayer. And we've gone through that many times where we talk about, you know, what the parts of that prayer are. We do, again, there's nothing wrong with learning the Lord's Prayer, teaching children to pray the Lord's Prayer. I'll tell you what, when I was on, on the school board, I don't know if they still do it, but when I was on the school board, we start every school board meeting with, Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer. We used to always still do that, even though that's probably been frowned upon by society more and more. We still did it, right? We used to teach our kids in school to do that. We don't do it anymore. We've lost the value of prayer in our society today, in general. And I believe, as a church, we've been complicit, right? I think even people in the church today pray less and less. This lesson today hopefully drives it home that we need to be praying more and more, not giving up in prayer. One one thing is uh, bringing prayer out, out of the situation is I can go to my little computer and I ask a question and it gives me an answer. Mm -hmm. See? And sometimes that's what we... So we become a society of instant gratification, instant answers. That's what we want. I want to know now. I want to see it now. I want it in my hands now. But if you look at the Bible and read through it and how God works, that's no, God is not a God of instant gratification. Most times, God allows us to wait for things so we learn to depend upon him in the waiting. We learn to look to him continually as we're waiting for answers to prayer. So, uh, now, we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward. Yes, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He also periodically taught about prayer to larger groups, and that's what this parable is about today. Today, we, <clears throat> we are the audience, along with those who were there that day, as we learn about prayer from Jesus himself as he told this parable. <clears throat> So we're going to start with Luke 18, 1 through 8. And I want you to take note of there's something in this scripture as we read it today that doesn't sound familiar to you. And we'll talk about that quickly, too. You'll, you'll get what I, you'll, you should get it. Okay, so 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That's why this parable is different than any other prayer, parable Jesus told. It's up front what the purpose of this parable is. It's right there. So you're already thinking about it before we get started. Jesus said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary, she said. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice 
so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Does that sound familiar to you? In that scripture, though? It's a, it's a change. We'll get back to that. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he, be, he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So that verse 5, the last phrase, so that she will, won't eventually come and attack me, that maybe you go, you scratch your head and say, I don't ever heard it read that way. Okay, so that is verse that's 18 8. So 18 8. I'll read it in an this is NIV, by the way, but it revised in 2011. Let me read it in, 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 in an NIV from the 1980s. I tell you, he will see that she gets justice and wait, no, I'm sorry. Back up. It's not verse 8. It's verse 5. Sorry, verse 5. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she get justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. That's how we normally read it. Now, I look this up. Every other translation says that where she, so she won't wear me out with her coming. The NIV changed it in 2011. And there's some scriptural background from the original language that does speak to that. Now, it could be more clearly said so she won't attack my character and ruin my reputation was actually some of the original language, and that's why they changed it. I, I just find that interesting because when I read it in here, I had never read it in this version where it says, so she won't come and attack me. I'd never read that before because uh, every other translation does that. So I just want to point that, that out, that that was kind of interesting that that change was made. They're, neither one are wrong because realize... Our English language is limited when you take the original and try to put it into English. So they're, if you kind of look at it all the way around, they're not, they're all right. And you'll see the same thread there through all those translations. Anyhow, just wanted to point that out. If you read that and go, I don't remember ever reading that phrase, so she won't come and attack me before, because I hadn't. Because I, all my NIVs are from like the 80s. <laughs> Anyhow. So Jesus told these two parables about prayer. And we're going to look at the first one. Emphasize the important qualities of prayer. We must both seek God with a persistence and a humble heart. The first is an admonition to keep on praying. That's what this first parable is about. So what does it mean to always pray? What does, that, what does it mean to you to always pray? That's the first thing that comes to my mind. You know, I mean... Whatever, whatever you're dealing with. Yeah, where, wherever I'm at or... Whatever. whatever it is I'm dealing with, wherever I'm at, as Bill just says, I my first thought should be to go to God about it. Before I go talk to somebody else for advice, mm -hmm. before you go talk to a co-worker, before you go talk to the pastor, before, go to God in prayer about whatever it is in your life that you're dealing with or you're, you're, you're facing, right? That is this always pray. Whatever the situation is, prayer should be involved whatever it is. Can we be in prayer continually every moment of every waking hour? We can live lives. No. Yes and no. We don't We don't go around with our eyes shut or down the road praying, hopefully. Don't do that. Okay, don't, don't do that. But you can be in conversation with God as you're driving to work or whatever, right? You can be taking a walk in the woods and being in prayer, talking to the Lord about whatever. And how you live should should demonstrate this life that you ha are in constant talking conversation with God. I probably get some guys at work sometimes a little early that may just wow. walk through the shop, check my things, and I talk to him like we're talking now. There you go. I'll say, who are you talking to? I'll say, God. Yep. Like, we need and we need to. That's exactly right, Sean. That's exactly right. We need. Yes, mom. The Holy Spirit sometimes lays people in our heart. It'll bring people before you. We don't have to. We can pray when they, we each help bring them to our mind. That's our part of it, too. Yes, pray then. When God brings somebody or some situation to your heart, your mind, that's part of this being in constant prayer. He's, he's nudging you to, hey, pray for that person or that situation, whatever it is. Um, why does prayer come more naturally at certain times more than others? And when is prayer the most difficult? So, it comes natural, as Bill said, is when we're in trouble. We feel, I need help. 
I cry out to God, right? But there are times when we need help that become more difficult to pray because we don't think God is listening, right? We don't feel like God is close. That's I, there, There's the thing I think is the most difficult. When you don't feel close to God, it's harder to go to prayer with him over situations. Well, doesn't that make sense? If you and your best friend have fallen out of favor with each other, doesn't that become more difficult to talk to them about some things? It does. That, so that makes sense. If we're not staying close to God, it becomes more difficult to reach out to him in prayer. So that means that we should be in God's word. We should be in church. We should be in prayer all the time. So we are closer. We we feel and recognize God's presence with us all the time. I think he likes to use that too. If you feel you've done something wrong, like you just said, and you feel like, man, I don't even deserve for him to listen to me. And it's like, no, you don't. So yes. Yes. You got to fight that too. Yes, the devil will use our own shortcomings and failures to keep the to try to keep us from talking to God. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Keep in mind, the devil doesn't want us to pray. There you go. The devil doesn't want any of us to pray. So that should be a lesson to all of us that we should pray. He doesn't want us to pray. He doesn't want us to read God's word. He doesn't want you in church. Well, that should be good enough reason to do those things, right? God doesn't pull away from you. No. You right. pull away from him. God never pulls away from us. Now, we can separate ourselves from God through sin, but again, that's us. That's not God. God is always desiring a relationship with us. It's kind of like, okay, good example, Adam and Eve in the garden. Right after they sinned, all of a sudden, God came near and called out to them, and what were they doing? Hiding. It wasn't God. God still desired to talk to them. God still desired to spend time with them. They had separated themselves from him. So again, God wants us to talk to him. Then uh, when David was uh, being disobedient to God, God didn't speak to him. He sent the prophet. Yes, so there you go. God will often you speak to others in our behalf. That's again, that's when God speaks to us to pray for somebody else. Guess what? He does it for you too. He speaks to somebody else to pray for you. Nathan the prophet was the one that had to go to David and, and remind him of why he was not hearing from God. Remind him of why he wasn't feeling God's presence near anymore because of his sin. And then guess what? David gloriously repented. That's the lesson. If we ever fear, if we ever feel that we're far away from God, it's only ever one step back, no matter how long we've walked away from God. And it's for forgiveness. Ask God to forgive you and restore the relationship. Um, sometimes we quit praying because we lose heart, right? Sometimes we feel like God isn't answering our prayer, so we quit praying. Sometimes we feel like, you know, does this, does even, does this prayer even make sense anymore, right? So why is prayer sometimes hard work? Why is prayer sometimes hard work? We, we, we need to be strengthened. From, have the strength from God, and that's the reason why we break through the barrier. Yes, do you, ever, do you remember the phrase, praying through? You used to hear that in church a lot. You don't hear that much anymore. I, I, I don't remember the last time I heard it in a sermon or praying through. What does that mean, to pray through? It means what we're talking about, to keep praying until God provides the answer. Till God provides the answer. Never give up. That's what this parable is all about. Here's some things that can uh, affect our praying. Okay? Our spiritual health. We've just been talking about that, right? Your mental health can affect your praying. Can it? When you're you're out of sorts. You don't you don't I don't know what to pray, right? Your mental health. Your physical health can affect your prayer as well. Because what do they do? These things, when we're out of sorts, when we're not feeling well, we're not whatever it is, it can cause discouragement. Um, it can cause us to feel defeated. But we don't allow those things to define our prayer life. Yes, they can temporarily keep us from praying, but don't allow them to keep you there in that place. Pray through. Keep praying. Go back to prayer. If it's been a while since you've prayed, go back to reading God's Word. If it's been a while since you've read, read, read His Bible, uh, why does the unjust judge eventually grant the widow's request? Why does he finally give give in to her? Because she's he is, wearing him down. He's wore him down. Okay, 
He got tired of hearing it from her. Okay? Now, let's look at what Jesus said. That's not why God will answer our prayers. Don't get that. We're going to get to that in a second, right? So, let's, let's compare and contrast the unjust judge's ruling compared to how God provides justice. Okay? God, is an, God will never get wore down through our prayers. We're never going to nag him to death. We're never going to wear him out like this unjust judge. So why does God, in, in converse, well, why does God answer our prayer? Because he knows our need. He knows our need, right? What, what we're, he knows what we're going to say before we say it. Yes, he, he does. what we're going to do before we do it. Yes. Okay, so here's... Here's the contrast. If a notoriously unjust judge eventually grants justice to an inconsequential widow, how much more will a just and loving God grant justice and quickly to us as chosen people? There's the comparison. I remember a time I was driving and I hit a bump. And before I crossed the bridge, I saw my car was sliding to the corner of that metal bridge. So I just took my hands, laid them down in my lap, and I said a few words. Immediately, that car turned around, broke. It broke the uh, that side in where I had two bruise marks on my my ankle. And I didn't feel, I didn't smell, I didn't, I had earlier took my glasses off, put them on, on that chair. They didn't move from that spot. So God had everything under control. That, and right there, you prayed, your prayer, that there's another lesson. Our prayers don't have, a, don't have to have a specific formula. They don't have to be a specific length. They don't have to be specific words. We talk to God because we know that he loves us. He's our loving Heavenly Father. And it's the communication between us and him in this relationship we have with him. And answers to prayer are sometimes like that. And sometimes there are years. Depending on what God wants to do and how he wants to do it. Most of our prayers, when, when they involve uh, someone else, those are the kinds of prayers that don't get answered really correctly or right, away. right on the spot well because a person's free will that he's given them is right. involved they're you're praying for somebody's salvation you may pray for years and years and years because god will never override their free will he might he might call to them which he will he all he he, he calls all to salvation so he will call to them from time to time or constantly he will put them in situations that make them look up to him it's, but it's still ultimately their decision whether they'll accept him or not. So that's why praying for somebody else is the one you definitely have to keep praying, never give up, because you never know what God is going to do, when he's going to do it, and how he's going to do it. So we need to be in constant prayer. We you do. have to accept the fact that you pray for someone to get saved. You have to also accept the fact that you need to accept whatever way God's going to do it. Right. And that can be a scary thing sometimes. Yes. When you're praying for somebody, you know, and you're saying God's will be done, that that's probably one of the most powerful and scary things sometimes because you have no idea what God's going to do to accomplish his will, right, in someone's life. So, so, so again, the first parable, we're, we're kind of wrapping it up here to move to the second one quickly, is to not, again, it's right at the beginning of Scripture. The reason for this parable is that they should always pray and not give up. That is the lesson to all of us. That is the lesson to all of us. I have one question now, Will. Yes. When they, they, they take this into uh, account here, do you have to pray for the same thing time and time again no. in order for God to answer that? You don't have to. Exactly. You should pray as God leads your heart. Now, it may be over and over and over because God is speaking to you in the situation or whatever it is. But here's the thing. We pray for whatever it is and leave it in God's hands. Right. But 
there's nothing wrong if you're praying for a lost loved one to bring their name up in prayer every day. So there, there, there's it's yes and no. It, you don't have to, but pray as God leads you in that situation. I'll tell you right now, if I'm praying for somebody in a situation, I'll definitely bring their name up in prayer every day about it, whatever it is, whoever it is, whatever it is. But you don't have to repetitively keep praying for that same thing. It's in God's hands. He's going to do it. But this is, again, don't give up in prayer. It, it's like a telephone call. You keep the the line open. You keep the line open between you and God. Let, the same thing for years. Yes. Years, yep. years. Yes. Same thing. There's nothing wrong with praying the same prayer over and over and over. But you don't have to. So, again... Like you said, leave it in God's hands. Leave it in God's hands. Leave, run back up and try to take it back. Yes. Or, 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 yes. I, I've seen I've seen that literally. Yes. Place, we do right? that sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's yes and no, right? We will don't give up in prayer, but it doesn't mean you always have to repeat the same prayer. Again, God will lead you in that. How how he, he speaks to your soul about what you should be praying about. All right, let's go to the next. It's the other half of Scripture, and it's the other parable. So he goes into this other parable. So we talked about persistence, never give up praying. The second part is about humility. So let's read the second half of uh, it's verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, Thank you. I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers. So, you know, this is this is, we're in pretty bad territory already that we're we're not only are we boasting, we're we're down we're putting down other people in the prayer. We shouldn't be doing that. Or even like this tax collector. Oh, he even singles out somebody. That's even worse, right? I fast twice a day and give a tenth of all I get. And we move to the other person, but the tax collector, who was looked down upon in society because he was working for the Romans, stood at a distance. He could not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus then says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, one whom justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, go ahead, Bill. Keep in mind that uh, when Rome was in, in uh, rule there, mm -hmm. They selected the who they wanted to be the tax collector. Yes. And that was not, and they generally selected a Jew because they knew that the Jew would be looked down on. Yeah, they, they, they purposely did that so they were not involved in what, you know, collecting the taxes. It, oh, look, it's your Jewish people who are collecting the taxes, even though it was all going to Rome. So in... in is there, there's something similar about this parable than it, that, to the Good Samaritan. Jesus uses, in the Good Samaritan, what did he do? The, Samar the hated Samaritan was the person who was being righteous, and the Levite and the priest were not. Similarly here, the Pharisee, who's normally be the person we looked up to, they're a righteous person, is the one who is acting unrighteous, and the Hated tax collector is the one who's being humble before God and actually being righteous. See, Jesus liked to do that in his parables to show our thinking and our stereotypes in our head are not always right. And really, the the other lesson is the outward. Don't ever rely on your outward appearance of what you think. Allow the heart to speak, and that's what we're seeing here in this parable. So, um. Makes you think of Zacchaeus, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> Zacchaeus became righteous. Well, guess what? Who was one of the disciples? Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew, the tax collector. Now, I do find one thing interesting. When Zacchaeus got right with God, he had to go back and make all this restitution. He gave back two, was it two or three times that he'd stolen, right? When Matthew gave up tax collecting and followed Jesus, you don't see any of that. So I would say that Matthew must have been a righteous man. And God, Jesus chose him because he had a good heart already. He was probably an honest guy who was only taking the taxes he had to take. Two different people. But anyhow, the second parable is also about prayer. Identifies, it identifies the spirit and attitude that God truly hears and honors. This is super important. We should always be humble before God. 
We should always be honest and, and in our prayers, and our prayer life should be about God and not about self. There's the things you're seeing different here in this, in this parable. So, whom does Jesus address in this second parable? Well, there was a Pharisee who, who was confident in his own righteousness, a righteousness, righteousness of his own making, and then also a tax collector. Okay? The Pharisee's prayer can be divided into two parts. So he boasts first. What did he boast about that he did and then what he did not do? So he boasts about what? Fasting and tithing. So the lesson again is fasting and tithing are good, but you also, it must be done with a right attitude and a right heart. You can do all you want to do in good works and they don't save you. They don't, you can do all the good works you want to do and they don't save you. Okay. What did he boast that he didn't do? Well, he says, I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. I don't cheat people or whatever with his taxes, right? That's what he was doing in this, in this, this, uh, this par the, in the prayer, right? That's what the Pharisee was talking about. Um, what kind of righteousness does God honor? What kind of righteousness, huh? We don't make ourselves right. We let God make ourselves. There you go. You, you said it exactly. Salvation comes from God, not us. It comes alone through Jesus Christ. It is a free gift of salvation through grace, which none of us deserve. Not, none of us deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't work our way towards it. We can't manufacture it. Only God does it in and through us. That's what God honors. It's not about works. It's about a right relationship with God. Serving him humbly, right? And, and I find this interesting that even though Jesus says this, this Pharisee said these things out loud, it wouldn't have been any, un, any less unrighteous if he had prayed it quietly and still thought it. What he thought was just as bad as what he said out loud. Because there's a lot of people that probably pray like this today, just quietly. Well, I'm glad I'm not this. Or I'm glad I'm, God, I haven't done that. And look at what I've done. That's kind of what the Pharisee did. God don't hear that. No, God doesn't hear it or honor it either. Nope. We are to humbly come before him. That's what the last scripture says, and we'll get to that in a minute. So, how does a life solely focused on works lead to arrogance? Well, what is works? It's what? We can do. Self-sufficient. Yep. So, we become self-sufficient and self-righteous when we focus on ourselves instead of God. You know what we do? We end up turning ourselves into a little God. Look at what I can do. Look at my, look what, man, I'm, look, I'm pretty good. Or as the world sees it, wow, my good works outweigh my bad works, right? That's just, just as wrong. That's a type of idolatry. It is. It, it is. So, again, we are to focus on God because he wants to bless us. He wants to answer prayer. He wants to give us a life more abundant spiritually. And in some things we get from that, right? Even physically. Um, so how is humility expressed in uh, this tax collector's demeanor and words? So unlike the Pharisee who boasted, the tax collector did what? He confessed to God his unworthiness. Mm -hmm. He could, So confession is important to God, that we, could, we admit we're a sinner, right? That's the, that's the beginning of our relationship with God. We admit our shortcomings. We admit our failures and humbly come before God and ask for forgiveness and then ask him to help us be more like Christ. That's what we're called to do. And that's what this task collector was really doing. So how does the gift of God, God's grace lead to humility? So if we have a right relationship with God, we're going to have a right perspective with God. We're going to see how wonderful and great he is and how our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. We are small and insignificant, yet he still loves us. We are to be content wherever he... Be content. Us. Yes, right, Dan. Be content with wherever God has placed us and with whatever he has given us, whatever that may be. So we are called to live for God, to serve Him, and look to Him. We have nothing to boast about. There's only one thing we're called to boast about in Scripture. What is that? 
in Christ. The only thing we should ever boast about and be proud about is what God has done and what he is doing in our lives. Nothing that of our own work, our own um, successes, or our own accomplishments, right? Um, yes. I, I like what a lesson writer said. He said the tax collector longed for the gifts of divine justification to be made right with God. Yes. But the Pharisee imagined he is already right with God. There you go. That 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 is a good. Uh, the lesson writer got that completely yeah. right. Yeah. We all need to recognize our need for God, and that's what the tax collector did. Because when you think, I'm already good, then you don't think you really need God's help much. You don't really think that God can make you any better. But you know what? God, God wants to continually work on us our entire lives. None of us ever make it. Pastor Niccolo used to say it all the time. All these years I've been living for God, I still haven't made it. God is still working on me, that little chorus. He's still working on me. God will continue to do that until we take our last breath. If we ever think we've made it and we we finally got we finally got it right, in our that's when we're in trouble. <laughs> that's when we're in trouble. If we but if we recognize that our life living for God is a continual process where God is going to continually work on us and help us to do better, to live better, to be better, then we, we're that's the thing we need that we're depending upon God. Day to day. Yep. You'll know you have it right when he takes you home. Yep. So how was the humble man exalted over the arrogant man? The humble man was the one who was justified before God. And that's what we want for our lives. We want God to look at us and say, well done, my faithful servant. We don't want to boast of what we have to say about ourselves shouldn't matter. It's what God has to say about it. So in wrapping up the lesson, Jesus taught the importance of praying and not giving up. Persistence. Perseverance is the ability to keep going even after difficulties or defeat sometimes. Persistence. Keeping at it. Is there truly such a thing as an unanswered prayer? Is, does God, God answers every prayer. It's either yes, no, or wait. God answers every prayer. It's either yes, no, or wait. Every time. So the absence of an answer now doesn't even mean no. It means always keep praying. That's what Jesus, the reason for this parable. Keep praying. If God in his sovereignty determines your prayer is not within his will, how will you know? Well, I wrote this down. Over time, God will direct your heart towards what his will is. If you keep praying and you keep saying, God's will be done in this situation. God, your will be done. He will eventually direct your heart in the way he wants you to go. You all heard that country song about thank God for unanswered prayers. Well, it's not really correct. It's thank God for the answer he did give, right? And I think in that old song, a guy was praying for something, and years later he looked back and go, Phew, I'm glad God didn't give me that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because what God has for us is always so much better than what we think we want at that time, Right? Because we don't see the future. We don't see the big picture. He he knows. So, again, just because we don't see an answer to prayer, it always doesn't always, it, it, you know, he's going to direct us in the way we're to go, in his will. And I, 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 I'll say this. Clarence Kramer and I had this conversation. You read a scripture, and it says that God will give you the desires of your heart in the Bible. And you go, well, what does that mean? It means the closer your heart is to God, you're going to desire what he wants. And I guarantee you, if you desire what God wants, he's going to give you the desires of your heart because you Plus. want what he wants. Plus. Plus. Life abundant. That's what it means. So, attitude and prayer. Jesus thought that our attitude, so we talked about persistence, attitude and prayer. Jesus thought that our attitude and prayer is as important as our persistence. In both parables today, each had a humble character and an arrogant one, right? Arrogant means feeling uh, superior. That's an overbearing attitude, okay? God honors both persistent prayer and humility in prayer. Some of us, some of you may have been crying out to God for years over something or someone, okay? Remember, the key to prayer is humility and persistence and saying, Lord, your will be done. Your, if we keep praying, we will eventually see the answers to those prayers. Might not be what exactly how we thought God should do it, but guess what? 
If when when God answers prayer, it'll always be the best answer to prayer. Better than we ever thought it could be. Have a blessed day. We're ready for morning worship.